Good evening. It's good to see all of you here tonight. We hope it's been a good day for you. Uh, it was for Judy and me. It was a beautiful day, beautiful drive up here this morning and then again back home and then back up here tonight. Uh, I told Judy, I said, this has always been one of my favorite drives. I've always enjoyed driving at the Muskingum. Uh, it's just beautiful terrain, just beautiful. I like West Virginia. Uh, I was born and raised in the first 11 years of my life in West Virginia, and we moved to Marietta when I was 11. But uh, I've always liked this scenery. Uh, the certain parts of it, from here to Zanesville, that I didn't care much for, but from here south, I liked. Especially since you got rid of the slaughterhouse, that's even better. <laughs> And for those of you that may not have lived here during that period of time, ask those who lived here during that period of time, and they can tell you what I'm talking about. Now, as I told you, the first time I ever came up here to speak, that was my one memory in McConnellsville. That slaughterhouse, not a pleasant memory. Now I've got good memories, good memories. Uh, I hope you brought your Bibles this evening, because this is going to be kind of a Bible study although it's going to be a lecture type of Bible study. Uh, I want us to look at some passages, and I want us to see what is taught there and what is not taught there that maybe we have thought was taught there before. And also remind us of what is taught there. Uh, I, I always tell people that when I preach, I don't have anything new to say. Uh, I simply try to share with people reminders of what the Word has said for over 2,000 years. And so what I share with you this week or any time in the future, any time in the past, has always been repetition, uh, which we learn by better than any other way. It's just the old stories. It's just the Gospel. It's just the Word. And you can't get any better than that. But we forget it. Uh, we kind of let it slip sometimes, and so times like this are times for us to get together and remind ourselves of what it says, and also remind ourselves of what it doesn't say, that maybe we thought that it did say. I want us to begin this evening, get your Bibles out, we're going to be looking at some passages, or your iPhone, or phones, or whatever you use, tablets, or whatever you use, but make sure when you use your phone, your tablets, they have the scripture on them. Okay? You're not on you're not on the internet. Make sure of that. We're gonna trust you. We're gonna trust you. Yeah, the first few times I saw people using those, I thought, boy, they're not interested at all. They're looking at some checking out something on the internet, and you come find out they were they had the text, the scriptures right there. I prefer paper. So I use the old fashioned way, the Bible. But if you prefer look at that screen, that's fine with me. But we're going to trust you to make sure you have it turned to the right screen. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 as we begin our study this evening. And uh, look at verse 16 down through verse 18. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore we do not lose heart, that is, we don't become discouraged, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That last part, that last verse again. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. Is that true? True or false in your life? Do you look at the things that are seen or you look at the things that are not seen? I would dare say that if I were to ask for a show of hands, including myself, which we do, most of us would raise our hands to the question, we look at things that are seen. We're visual people. We're visual people. Uh, we, 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 we learn better by seeing. We want to see it. We want to touch it. We want to feel it. We want to experience it. And life is like that. Life is that. And so we are naturally inclined to look at things that are seen, not at things that are not seen. Now hold on to that passage. Uh, one time as a little boy, I heard a story about him that he wanted to buy a dress for his mother. 
And so he went to the dress shop and uh, he told the attendant, the, the, the uh, clerk, uh, what he wanted. And she said, well, what size is your mother? And he said, she's just the right size. And she said, what size is that? She said, I don't know. And so there's some other customers there in the store and she pointed to a, kind of a teat like lady and said, is she that size? And he shook his head, no. Point kind of a, a little bit bigger lady, middle size, medium size. Is she that size? He says, no. He pointed kind of a lady that was pleasantly plump. We're, we're going to be polite. And he said, is she that size? He said, yes. Now, to the medical profession, that woman was not the right size. But that child who saw beyond the flesh and blood, saw beyond the physical side, saw something, something that made her to him just the right size. She fit him perfectly. She was all he needed. She was just the right size. I want us to look at two scriptures, two passages, primarily this evening as our text. Now keep 2 Corinthians 4 in mind. We're not going to leave that thought. Uh, 2 Timothy, or 1 Timothy, rather, the second chapter, and then 1 Peter, the third chapter. The first few verses of 1 Peter 3, the last few verses of 1 Peter, I mean 1 Timothy 2. We're going to read them together, and then we're going to kind of compare them and use primarily 1 Peter 3 as our basis of our study this evening. He says in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9, Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for a woman making a claim to godliness. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. It was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman, being deceived, fell into transgression. But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Now keep your finger there, or your bookmarker, or piece of paper, whatever, and go over to 1 Peter chapter 3, begin with verse 1. In the same way, you wise, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Your dormant must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Those two passages we've looked at, we've examined, we have criticized, we have struggled with for years. We've gone to them to see who's supposed to pray in a mixed audience, men or women. Only men, or can women pray in the presence of men? We've gone there and we've asked the question about, can women teach whenever men are present? Uh, we've gone there to look at modest apparel, modest clothing. We've gone to 1 Peter the third chapter to look at can a woman wear jewelry, gold and pearls and things such as that? Those have been some of the questions we've looked at in examining those passages. But let me suggest something to you. Maybe we have missed the point of both of those passages in using them that way. 
as you look at the context of those two passages, what Paul is saying in 1 Timothy 2, what Peter is saying in 1 Peter 3, he is not so much addressing the authority of man or what a woman can or cannot wear or what a man can or cannot wear or the type of clothing they're supposed to wear, how much clothing they're supposed to wear. But what he's addressing is the attitudes, the attitudes of the people that are wearing the clothing, the attitudes that are present whenever men and women together are together, the attitudes when they're trying to work together. That's what he's talking about. And that's what we want to look at this evening. He described there in 1 Peter 3 and verse 4, he referred to this inner person of the heart. This inner person of the heart. He says, that's where the emphasis needs to be. Now remember going back to 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16 through 18. We don't look at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen. The things that are seen are temporary. The things that are seen are decaying. Look in the mirror and how we have changed. At one time, I didn't have wrinkles. Not here, I had them here. Bunches of them down there. I lost a little bit of weight. I didn't have gray hair. I didn't have a double chin or a drooping chin. I didn't have bags in my eyes, nor did you. But you see, this body is shifting. It's dying. From the time that body comes out of the womb, it begins to die. And we are evidence of that. And Paul is saying there in 2 Corinthians 4, he said, we are decaying people. This body was not made to exist forever. Now, in the beginning, it was. Adam and Eve made a terrible choice. But after they made that choice, then our bodies were not created to last forever here on this earth. In heaven, we're going to get a new body. It's not going to decay, but this one is. Knowing that, and knowing that the inner man is what God really looks at, remember, remember the story about Samuel going to anoint a king from David's family? He looked at all these sons, these robust men, these good-looking men, and those were king material. Not David. But God says, you and I look at things differently, Samuel. You, along with all the human race, looks at the outer man, the appearance. I look at the heart. That's what Peter's saying here. He says, and let it be the hidden person of the heart. He says, my emphasis is on the inner person. Last week, just out of curiosity, I Googled the cosmetic industry to see how much money is spent annually on cosmetics. Now, I'm talking about any beauty aids. I'm talking about aftershave, anything like that. I'm talking about deodorant shampoo, all that is in the cosmetic industry in addition to the makeup. <coughs> on an, every year, on an average, American people spend $49.3 billion on the outer man. That same article went ahead to report that we average in American households anywhere every month from $244 to $313 a month on cosmetics, some form or the other. Now you may use less, you may use more, 
Glenn, you may want to use more. <laughs> it may not help, but let's give it a shot, okay? <laughs> the people here would thank you for that. Glenn wasn't here this morning, so I'm going to get him this evening. <laughs> but that's our emphasis, isn't it? Emphasis is on decorating the outer man. <clears throat> And we forget about where God's emphasis is. It's on the inner man. I've known, and you have too, a lot of beautiful people physically. I know one woman, I mean, she is, she's a beautiful woman. But she has a stinking attitude. Rotten attitude. Nasty person. Hard to get along with. The inner person has been overlooked, but the emphasis was on the outer person. She's a pretty person, but not on the inside. I remember hearing as a little boy, I never understood this until I got a little bit older. Beauty is only skin deep. Another one I always heard, beauty is as beauty does. That's what God is saying here. The emphasis is supposed to be on the inner man. And I'm not saying don't buy cosmetics, don't wear makeup. I'm not saying that. Don't wear jewelry. That's not what this passage is about. And we're gonna, I'm going to show you more about that in just a minute. But what I'm saying is let's put the emphasis where God does, on spending more time on developing the inner man and making the inner man beautiful than we do on making the outer person beautiful. That's what Peter and Paul both are saying. Now, using the passage in 1 Peter, let's look at some of the characteristics that we need to be working on. Some of the things that he says, these are what's important to the Father. These are what's important to God in the life of the person. As you observe their chaste and respectful behavior, chaste means pure. It comes from the word hypnos, the same word from which we get holy, sanctified, all the same word. It's one who is set apart. That's what holy and sanctified means. Chaste means they're holy, they're set apart, they're, they're, they're pure. As Paul tells in Romans the 12th chapter, verse 2, don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, by re renewing of that inside of you that's, that's more permanent, that's eternal. Don't be conformed, don't fit into the world's molds, but be transformed beyond that. Don't look at it from the world's perspective, look at it from God's perspective. God says, here's what's important. Purity is important. Let's go back now to 1 Timothy 2. Listen to what Paul says on this. He says, I want women to adorn themselves with the proper clothing modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments. We have gone to that passage for years to teach that a Christian should not wear shorts or a Christian should not wear swimming suits because they are not modest apparel. They're not modest clothing. That is not what modest means, folks. Look in the dictionary. Modest means it's not ostentatious. It's not showy. It's what Paul is saying here. It's not the quali quantity of clothing that you're wearing. That's not what he's talking about, although that's important. But that's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is the attitude for wearing that clothing. You can have your body fully covered and still be immodest. Because immodest means I wear this to attract attention to myself. That's what modest, immodest means. Modest is not showy, not ostentatious. It's not worn to say, look how important I am. Look how successful I am. Look at the clothes that I wear. 
Let me tell you how much I paid for them. Let me tell you where I bought them. That's immodest. That's lacking humility. That's what Paul is talking about here. It's also discreet, which means basically the same thing. Look at the dictionary. It means not ostentatious, not showy, not to attract attention to oneself. It's worn humbly. You're just going about your business. You're a humble person. You're just a quiet person, just going about your business, trying to serve God. He doesn't leave it there, though. Look at the next verse, verse 10. Instead of wearing immodest clothing, that which attracts attention to yourself, such as braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, look at the context, that's what he's talking about. But rather, instead of doing that, adorn yourself with good works as is proper for women, and let's insert men there too, because the principle goes both ways, making a claim to godliness. If you want to look at a passage to help you determine what kind of clothes should I wear, that's the passage. I should wear, choose to wear clothing as a man or as a woman that is characteristic of one who is making a claim to godliness. Now, I can wear these fancy clothes and gold and pearls and piercings and all that stuff to attract attention to myself and because I'm not making a claim to godliness. Or I can wear the same outfit and still be one who is trying to be godly because I, my motive is not to attract attention to myself because it's just my taste. And so when you choose to buy a garment, or you choose to participate in an activity, you choose to say something, you choose to write a letter, you choose to write an article for the newspaper, or you choose to do anything, anything, I don't care what it is, this is one of the criteria you ought to use. Does it fit in the character of one who is making a claim to godliness? Is this one characteristic of one who is trying to be like Christ? That will help you better determine what kind of clothing to wear, what kind of attitude to have, how to treat somebody, how to speak to your spouse, how to treat your children, how to talk to your parents. Is this characteristic of one who is making a claim to godliness? That's what it means to be chaste. It's one who is pure. One who is pure is, that's being characterized by one who's making a claim to godliness. Now going back to Peter again, he says, chaste and respectful. We hit on this in both lessons this morning. And so I don't want to belabor the point other than to say that that respect is respect for God. That respect is respect for myself. That respect is respect for my spouse, respect for my children, respect for my parents, respect for my co-workers. It's respect for every person that I come into contact with. I'm not rude with them. If I'm one who is making a claim to godliness, if I'm respectful, if I am working on this inner being, this inner man, or this inner woman, that I'm going to be respectful of others. When I talk to somebody, I'm going to speak to them respectfully. When I talk about somebody, I'm going to talk about them respectfully. I don't care who it is. I don't care whether somebody that you feel deserves respect or not. If they are a person created in the image of God, and that's anybody that's born in this world as a human being, then we need to choose to speak respectfully of them. Because remember, we are speaking of one that God has created. We are speaking of one for whom Jesus our Lord died. 
and we ought to respect them. God respected them. He may not like the way they're living. We may not like the way they're living. We may not condone that. We may not like what they're doing. But still, we respect them because they are a human being. We may not respect what they're doing, but we respect them because they occupy a place in the human race. And when I work on this inner man, the respect is going to be a part of that inner man. So when I speak to Judy... I need to speak to her respectfully. When I talk about her, I need to talk about her respectfully, and she did the same. When I speak to my children, the same principle. When I speak to any of you, the same. When you speak to me, we may have disagreements. Judy and I may have disagreements, but that should never be an excuse to be disrespectful, be rude. One of the qualities of love in 1 Corinthians 13 is not behaving ourselves unbecomingly, not being rude. So if I love my spouse, I love my children, I love my parents, I'm not going to be disrespectful, I'm not going to be rude toward them. That's unloving. And so as I work on this inner man, uh, the, this inner person of the heart, then I'm going to work on being chaste, pure, holy. I'm going to work on being respectful because that's a part of this inner man that I need to be developing. But he continues in 1 Peter, the third chapter. He says in verse 4, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious, which is precious prized in the sight of God. What's prized in the sight of God, Peter? A gentle and quiet spirit. Some translations have there meek and quiet spirit. Do you ever notice how meek is spelled? It's spelled M-E-E-K. It is not spelled W-E-A-K. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength. Jesus was described as being meek and lowly in heart. Jesus was a strong individual. As that song sing, that we sing often, he could have called 10,000 angels. He could have struck all those people dead that day. And as a kid, I often wonder, why didn't he do that? But you see, I was looking at things through my eyes, not through God's eyes. He had that kind of power. He had that kind of strength. See, meekness, not weakness, meekness is controlled strength. It's that gentle giant. It's that individual that knows that they're strong, but they don't use their strength because it's going to hurt somebody. They know they've got the vocabulary. They know they've got the, the ability to level somebody with, with a cut, with a sarcastic remark, but a meek individual won't do that because they control that. If you look back again, go back to 1 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 15. He's in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Self-restraint. You may be the smartest person in the room. You may have the best arguments and the best ability to argue and to win all arguments. You may know how to level a person, how to shut a person up, how to shut them down. But Paul says, a modest person, a meek person, as Peter describes them, won't do that. They won't do that. But let me show you what they will do. Go back to the book of Ephesians where we were this morning, but we're going to go to one other chapter, the chapter, a couple chapters before that. Ephesians chapter 4. Now remember what we're talking about here this evening. And what we're talking about this week, we're talking about family matters, matters of the home. But this is broader than that, but specifically that's what we're talking about. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29 beginning. 
Let no unwholesome word, unwholesome simply means unhealthy, that which doesn't give health to somebody. Let no un unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification. He says, don't let any unwholesome word, unhealthy word proceed from your mouth. Only those words should proceed from your mouth that build up. That build up. According to the need of the moment, according to what that moment needs, what that person needs, so they will give grace to those who hear, so that it will be a gift to them. When you're speaking to your spouse, when you're speaking to your children, whether growing or still under your roof, when you're speaking to your parents, when you're speaking to anybody, but those are in our context for this week, those words should be words that build up. If it does not pass the test of edifying that person, of building that person up, then restrain from saying it. You may have the, the choicest word that will, will win the argument, that will level them, will shut them up and shut them down. But if it does not build them up, don't say it. Don't use it. Be the better person. That's what meekness is. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is controlled strength. You know you've got the ability to level that person with a word or with an argument. But a meek person won't do that. A meekness, a meek person will control that strength. They will withhold saying that because they know that it will not build them up. So if a word is not edifying, if a statement does not edify, if it doesn't build that person up, he says, don't use it. You may have the best argument in the world that can win that argument, but if it destroys that other person, instead of building them up, don't use it. It's not worth it. It may cost them their soul, and it may cost your soul too. It's going to cost a relationship, definitely. He said, only those words that edify, that build up, according to the need of the moment. Whatever that moment needs, then be wise to determine what words to use. So that we'll give grace to those who hear. Grace is a gift. You may think they deserve to be leveled. They deserve to be humbled. Grace says, no, I will avoid doing that. That's God's place, not mine. What I would do, I would choose words. I would choose a line of reasoning that will build them up. It will also build our relationship. It will make it stronger. I learned a long time ago that nobody wins an argument. Nobody wins an argument. If somebody feels they've won the argument, they've lost. What they've lost is they've lost a part of the other person's respect, and they may have even lost a friendship. See, when somebody wins an argument, both people lose. One person loses the argument, the other loses the, the other person's respect. Don't ever, don't ever discuss anything, I don't care what it is, other than for the purpose of trying to find a resolution to the problem. Don't ever enter an argument trying to prove who's wrong and who's right. Always discuss any matter for one purpose, and that is, is to resolve the problem. And that means you're going to leave sarcasm out. You're going to leave your biting remarks out. You may leave, you're going to leave lines of reasoning out that is going to level that person, make you look better. You're going to leave that out because it's not going to edify. That's what Paul, Paul is saying here in, in Ephesians 4. He says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. If that's your attitude right then, what you need to do before approaching that person is go privately. Say, God, help me to get my feelings under control so we can discuss these rationally. Because I don't want any bitterness or wrath or anger or clamor or slander to be involved in this discussion. 
but I want to be kind to that person. I want to be tenderhearted. I want to be forgiving, just as God in Christ has forgiven me. Oh, wouldn't that resolve a lot of the heartaches in our families? If we approach every discussion with that in mind and with those guidelines, that I don't enter an argument to win. I enter that not as an argument, but as a discussion to resolve the problem so that we can be okay, so we can be one. And so the, the point of this is do what is necessary to edify that relationship, to build that person up. And if it doesn't, Pray about it until you can approach it where it will. And so going back now to 1 Peter 3, he says uh, this gentle, bit, well, hold on, with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit which is praised in the sight of God. Wait a minute, right? Hold on. Yeah, that's where I need to be. Uh, no. What, what happened here? <laughs> I lost my train of thought. Did you ever do that? Don't lie. Oh, okay, here. Lost my train of thought. Anyway, don't enter an argument to prove who's right or who's wrong, okay? Enter an argument as a discussion to resolve the problem. And that's what we need to be about. Uh, let me see here. Somebody said one time the mind was first to go. I don't know. Hmm. Let's go back here to... Mine's going blank. Sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, the point of our whole discussion this evening is, is trying to be the people God wants us to be. It's trying to work through problems the way God wants us to work through them. It's to help each other become more like Christ, become more like God. And, and to avoid the things that build barriers that build walls between us and do everything we can to remove those walls and to and, and to be be one the way God wants us to be and to and to help each other helps you other to grow and to develop and so that some of these days together we hear God say come home into the joys prepared for you from the foundations of the world that's what we're about. It's about trying to be the people God wants us to be, to humbly serve Him, to humbly serve our wives, serve our husbands, serve our children, serve our parents, to humbly walk together. So some of these days we go home together. It's not a matter of who wins or who loses. It's a matter of simply serving God a matter of winning that crown together. And that's what you and I need to be about, to really be serving God together. And that's not always easy, is it? It's not always easy at all, but that's what we're supposed to be about. Let's pray together. Father, we, we thank you for being our Father. We thank you for being patient with us. We thank you for showing us how to live. We thank you for helping us to see what kind of attitudes we need to have by watching your son and see how he responded to situations and how he responded to people, how he dealt with differences. Father, help us to do the same. Help us to be more like him, not like the world. And Father, help us to allow him to dictate our response to each other and not the world. Father, help us to control our emotions. 
help us to see things and see each other from your perspective and not from ours. And Father, help us to put ourselves aside and our feelings aside and be the people that you want us to be in all of our relationships. Father, help us to be humble people. Help us to follow in your son's footsteps, not in the world's. We thank you, and we praise you, and we honor you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. This evening, as we bring this part of our service to a close, we want to ask each one of us, is my relationship with my spouse and my children, is my relationship with, with God what it ought to be? If not, who has broken it? And most of the time it's us. And there's something in our lives that we need to have prayers about, to surround each other and pray about. Just come forward and ask for that tonight. Or if you've never become a Christian and you believe in Christ and you want to put him on in baptism this evening, we'll be glad to assist you with that this evening. Or if there's another need you have, we'll be glad to help you in that direction as well. So if you have any need at all, whether it's to become a Christian or to be restored or to, to ask for the prayers of the church, why don't you come let that need know and ask together we stand and sing this song that was announced before the last time.